All righty, very good. First of all, good evening and welcome to our Western Cuyahoga Audubon monthly members meeting and speaker series. And I am Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga. It is Tuesday, January 3rd. Can you believe it already? 2023. And of course, we can't come on screen. Let's please move to the next screen. There you go. So I did want to welcome and ha say Happy New Year to everyone. Like I say, I do hope everyone's New Year is starting off well. Um, I'm going to mention a few things. We just had our Christmas bird count on Friday, December 30th, and, and we did very, very well. well I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, I do want to mention that if you'd like to sign up for the WCAS e-newsletter, which comes out once a week, generally on a Tuesday, and you can sign up uh, via our website, and you can see the link there, but you can check it out at our website and sign up. These e-newsletters come through uh, MailChimp. And they are reminders about events, programs, things that we have going on. Sometimes there's something that comes up quickly and we can get that on that e-newsletter as well. So we hope that you can sign up. Remember now, if you feel like you're just getting too many of them, we generally do this once a week, but if you feel like that's still too many, you can unsubscribe at any time. We hope you won't, but you, that's a, an option. And of course, we always would like people to become members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. You just hit our website, www.wcaudubon.org. Very easy to find the button that says membership. And you can um, PayPal, uh, Square, use your credit card. There's many, many ways that you can become a member. And we have lots of things going on all the time. Not only our members speaker series, but field trips and bird walks and uh, well, we'll have more coming up. So we hope that you can th think about joining. All righty. Our Christmas bird count, as I mentioned, was on uh, Friday, December 30th. And we had glorious weather. Um, it was partly to partly to mostly sunny. Uh, temperature ranged from about mid 50s to the mid 60s. There was a little rain for some. For others, there was a little bit more rain, but I mean, all in all, we, we could not have had a much better Christmas bird count weather, considering the week before we had that, that horrible, horrible below zero wind chill of weather. So in just a week, we had wonderful weather. Um, not all of the checklists are in quite yet. Our preliminary species count, and for those of you who participated in the Christmas count, I think you're going to be surprised. 89 species, which is, I think, the highest we've ever had. Um, of course, the people along the lakefront do a fantastic job of finding the waterfowl. And I think a lot of birds from up north were pushed down by that weather. And that just really uh, brought up our numbers uh, of, of waterfowl and ducks and uh, water birds. So great sightings included the harlequin ducks, red-necked grebe. There was a fallout of red-throated loons. I mean, well over a hundred, which I don't think we've ever had. Um, Short-eared owls were sighted, eastern meadowlark. Now, for some of you who might not be in the area, an eastern meadowlark might, yeah, we have those all the time. Well, not here in Ohio in the winter time generally. So this is a, a just a, a really, really short uh, summary of some of the uh, surprises, the highlights that we had. Um, the complete count uh, information will go up on our website uh, shortly. It'll have the list of all the species, plus a, a nice narrative, as well as a list of participants. Speaking of participants, we had 84 people out in the field or feeder watching. Again, 
that was fabulous. So again, we just thank everybody for being out and, and enjoying the weather and enjoying the birds too. Oh, come on. There you go. Our next uh, presenter, um, Michelle Brocious, who will be doing our program, but she's also a board member and field trip co-coordinator. And she has a number of things that she'd like to, to chat about. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Hi. thank you, Nancy. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, my, my slides are running a little slow. I don't know why, probably because we have so many people. Come on. Come on. There you go. All right, so I'm going to cover our upcoming bird walks and how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide. All right, please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. Uh, the next one is on January 14th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in January, we were treated to several American tree sparrows, as well as great looks at a pair of pileated woodpeckers. A sharp shin hawk appeared to be following or chasing a bald eagle, and the barred owl was perched high in the trees for some great viewing. Uh, join us this Saturday to see what nature has in store for us this year. Oh, and then, okay, um, so we're on the slide for the report. So uh, this past second Saturday was held on December 10th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, the December 2nd Saturday of the month bird walk had the temperature both start and finish at 39 degrees and was cloudy throughout the entire walk. 18 observers spotted 21 species. It was a typical December walk. Most of the expected species were observed. 17 house finch were counted. Highlights were few with 10 tree sparrows and two common loon flyovers. All right, next slide. All right, so please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for our Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. The next one is on January 28th at 9 a.m., meeting at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of West 13th Street and east of the I-90 Interbelt Bridge. Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk, and they will guide you north through Scranton Flats area of the Towpath. All right, next slide. Yeah, I'm just going to mention the photo there is Lester. He's the he's a, okay. our, our celebrity Lester Scout that stays here all year. There's something that he just can't fly, but he's here in the summer. He's here in the winter. Even he's in his glory right now because there are some Lester Scout friends <laughs> joining him. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he's happy. I'm new to the group, but that is beautiful coloration. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded, like the speaker series meeting, and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. I believe that's it for me. Thanks thank so you, much, everyone. Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Um, next, uh, Drina Nemes will chat with us a little bit about our book discussion series. So, Drina, I know you've joined us. Hello good there. Evening. Yeah, hi. And, and good evening. Yes. Uh, welcome to a, a discussion of our book discussion series uh -huh. this year, and we're featuring themes of climate change adaptation, migration, and species studies, especially about this uh, misunderstood pigeon. Next slide, please. Uh, we uh, are, Oops. yes, third Tuesdays is our general uh, meeting time. Uh, this month though, however, it'll be on the fifth Tuesday. So please join us January 31st, mm -hmm. seven to 8 p.m. And then we're back on our schedule the third Tuesday for April 18th. Next slide, please. A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Book is such a delightful book. And it is definitely part field guide. If you like field guides, it's a wonderful little book, part history, ornithology primer, and altogether, it is really a fun book. Next slide, please. 
Um, Rosemary Moscow is an artist and uh, a cartoonist, is also a science communicator. And so this book is highly visual with a lot of uh, cartoons and sidebars, and it's uh, fun to read. Next slide, please. Um, I encourage people also, if you're interested in learning more about uh, bird books and bird discussions, Environment of the Americas Book Club is excellent. They meet the fourth Thursdays, and uh, their next meeting is January 26th. And it's actually going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern time because their speaker is in uh, is in England, Tim Burkhead, and his book Birds and Us is a history of how humans and birds have uh, evolved together. Next slide, please. I'm just going to join it and mention here, uh, Drina. I've read this book. It's very good. Again, it's 12,000 years looking at birds, how people oh. have looked at birds for over the millennia so oh yeah, it's, it's thanks for good. yeah thanks for uh, that comment yeah. i'm glad you've read it yeah next slide please the uh another wonderful series is the urban birder series with david lindo and he has been here with the audubon society of western cuyahoga and he's a delightful a uh, delightful host um he has a um a series called In Conservation With, and that's where he has his interview and presenters. Um, so you can find that at his uh, the urbanbirderworld.com website. He also interviewed our, our future author here, Rosemary Moscow, about her book, and it's a delightful presentation. And then also, for those of you who know Jen Brumfield, he interviewed Jen Brumfield um, July 31st of 2020, and it's a wonderful interview. For January, he has quite an ambitious schedule. Um, he has sessions on January 9th, 12th, 19th, 23rd, 26th, and 30th. It looks, it's like every Monday and Thursday. Just a wonderful uh, series. And next slide, please. So um, here's our series for our book selections for this year. We enjoyed Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid and next is Pigeon Watching. And then in April, Scott Widensall's A World on the Wing. This had been a bestseller uh, and just full of all kinds of uh, up-to-date information on the migration of birds. So hope you can join us January 31st and hope you can join us April 18th. Thank you so much, Drina. Appreciate your enthusiasm about the books and uh, they are very, very good. And we're always looking for ideas for books for yes. next year. So please again, send information to info at WC Audubon. That is where we pick up uh, our mail and take a look at it. Uh, next is Marianne Romito, and who is our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Hi, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Audubon, National Audubon has started a new program called Audubon's Climate Watch. Um, and next slide. The, the back up, okay. Um, we, what we're doing is we're surveying um, areas in Northeast Ohio to see how climate change is impacting birds. And the, the time period is from January to 15th to February 15th. Next slide. Um, what, if you want to participate, um, you can either watch the video that's, the link is here on, on the, the um, no, on the website right here, or on the slide right here. Or you can just give me a call and um, you can, I can either try to walk you through it or, or you can uh, gladly watch the, the program tomorrow with Kirt Kirtland Bird Club. There you are. I'm gonna repeat the program tomorrow night at, at, at Kirtland Bird Club. And I put the link to the Kirtland Bird Club uh, program for Eventbrite. If you haven't registered for that program, you can register on that link that I put in the chat. The, uh, 
the, uh, if you're a member of Curtin the Bird Club, you've heard, you should have already gotten an email from Patty saying when the, you know, with the link to the, to the meeting. So we look forward to hopefully you coming in and joining our, our, our climate watch. The, uh, the date that what we, we're going to try to do is get everybody to do it on the same date for riding the weather's fine. And that'll be January 21, uh, which is a Saturday. So um, let's see, next slide. We're done. Okay. Yep. So yeah, if you have any questions, give me a call back at my phone number or send me an email at, at that email that's on the screen. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. And uh, we have a number of people who have already signed up that you get a, an area that you are to survey. Marianne will walk you through it or and or if you can watch the uh, video or join into the Kirtland Bird Club uh, and, and watch the presentation there. I know I need to be refreshed, so I am probably going. No, I will be joining in tomorrow as well. Thanks, Marianne. Um, I'm not sure, Amanda, are you here this evening? I know Amanda is a very busy person, but she is our coffee coordinator. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon sells a variety of, of coffee from a roaster called Birds and Beans Coffee. They're the only 100% Smithsonian certified bird friendly, boy, that's hard to say, all in one, one breath, um, which means that the, the uh, coffee is shade grown, which leaves the uh, up under the uh, upper story of the trees intact in the tropical regions. It is organic and fair trade. Um, so it, it provides uh, employment for people and uh, really just, it helps the environment as well. So really a lot of our, our birds here that nest uh, spend most of their time in those Central and South American forests. So if the, tr if the vegetation is left intact, those birds have a much better chance of of surviving and then coming back to join us in the spring. But the coffee can be ordered through the Western Cuyahoga homepage. Uh, you'll see either a button that says coffee club or as you can see the link here, wcaudubon.org, Bird Friendly Coffee Club, HTML. Um, our next order is going in very soon, January 10th. Uh, is the last day to get the coffee order to us. The order will be sent on January 11th. Coffee is roasted and shipped back to us uh, in about a week. And then it is delivered to your home or we set up a time where, or a place where we can uh, deliver it to you. So you don't have to go anywhere. We bring it right to you. So. Get it now because our next shipment, our next order is not going in until April and you wanna stay caffeinated this whole winter, right? Unless you want decaf. I do wanna mention our speaker for the month of February, uh, Natasha Bartolotta from the National Loon Center is going to talk about loons and lakes stewardship, building a national loon center. Uh, the construction hasn't begun yet, but the importance of the northern, uh, well, Canada and the, the northern tier of countries, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Mi Michigan, New York, places like that are critical for, for loons. Uh, especially the common loon. Um, but as we found out for over this Christmas bird count, the Great Lakes are a very important for those birds on migration, either heading south or heading north. So uh, I hope that, that Natasha will touch on those uh, that aspect as well. So we hope that you can join us on Tuesday, February 7th. Again, our meeting starts at 7.30, the speaker will begin around eight o'clock. So Natasha Bartolotta will be speaking about loons and lake stewardship, building a national loon center.
But this evening, of course, we have our own Michelle Brocious, who is a board member and again, the field trip coordinator. You heard her speak a little earlier. And Michelle really discovered that passion for birding in 2017 during a, a women's retreat in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Then in 2019, uh, Michelle completed the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Training and acquired skills to volunteer in meaningful ways and be an advocate for and steward of Ohio's natural spaces and wildlife. She, her, she earned her OCVN certification later that year by completing 40 hours of volunteerism and conservation with conservation organizations, one of which being Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And Michelle is currently on the board of directors of WCAS. In 2020, just a couple years ago, Michelle took up wildlife photography, mostly focusing on birds, uh, and I think you're going to really see that that she has surpassed a lot of photographers that I've seen in the past. This is great. Michelle has a BA in scientific and technical communication and a, a master's of education in career and technology education from Bowling Green State University. Michelle works for a large regional bank in the training and development department and is a proud mom of two boys. She currently resides in Rocky River with her husband and children. So Michelle, we'd love to have you share your screen. I am going to stop sharing, okay? Thank you so much, Nancy, for that introduction. I'm going to get my screen set up the way I like it, um, and then I will share. So just bear with me okay. for a moment here. Okay, one second. Here we go. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. All okay. right, fantastic. All right, um, so hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining me this evening. Uh, Nancy approached me a couple months ago about presenting my photography, and when I agreed, she asked me to provide a description of the event, and I wasn't sure exactly what to say about it. Um, so I wrote something generic. <laughs> and then a few weeks ago, when I started developing this presentation, it just kind of turned into my year of birding. So I'm going to take you through my favorite wildlife encounters of 2022. I'm also going to talk just a little bit about some composition guidelines I like to follow. Uh, there will be a few slides almost immediately about that, but the majority of this presentation will focus more on the birds themselves and not so much on my technique. Um, for those of you who are curious, I do get asked quite often what camera I use. Uh, the photos from January to March were taken with a Panasonic Lumix G85. And then in April, I upgraded to a Panasonic Lumix GH6, which is the newest model in the Lumix series. I also use a Leica DG Vario 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And I will let you know during this presentation when I switch to my new camera. All right, so I'm going to begin my year here with the finches of West Creek Reservation on January 22nd. Here is a female house finch in the soft morning glow of January. I caught her eating a bud off of a tree, and here she is going in for it. And then twisting a little to pry it off the tree. and sweet success. You can see she has it in her beak. And here she is again, content. Very nice. Thank you, Gabby. And then here's a male house finch at West Creek. As you can see, he has a yellow color band on his right leg. He actually also has a red band on his left leg. You just can't see it in this photo. 
I did submit a report to the USGS Bird Banding Laboratory, which I always make an effort to do when I encounter abandoned bird. West Creek Reservation was also full of American goldfinch, beautiful golden birds shining brightly in the white snow. I loved how this bird was clinging to and feeding from the golden plants and grasses in front of the snowy ground. And goldfinches almost exclusively feed on seeds. In fact, unfortunate brown-headed cowbird chicks who find themselves on a goldfinch nest will seldom survive the strict seed-only diet. So also on January 22nd, I found these morning doves all lined up in a row. I want to use this photo to demonstrate a photo composition guideline that I love to follow called the rule of thirds. So in the rule of thirds, you divide up your image into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. So it looks like a tic-tac-toe board. The rule states that for good composition, your subject should fall along one of these lines. In this photo, you can see the morning doves are primarily along the top horizontal line, what I have labeled as the A line. The three morning doves on the left truly fall along this line. And then the two doves on the right dip down just a little, but I think it works because they dip down within the right third of the photo. Michelle, on the, the one thing I was curious from when Drina put the uh, pigeon thing on there, Again, mm -hmm. I'm not a bird advocate, but I'm I'm getting interest. Okay. But the difference between pigeon and doves sometimes for me, my wife's better at it. It's hard to define because the the to me the dove resembles the pigeon. What is the what would you say is the best defining thing to extinguish the two between each other? So I know they're in the same family, but I have not read the book yet, so I don't know exactly what distinguishes a dove from a pigeon. Um, Nancy, do you happen to know that? Or Drina, if you've read the book already, you might know. Um, I haven't read the book yet. This is Nancy, but okay. you know, pigeons like the rock pigeon, um, which is basically a, a, a little a, a dove, um, that's kind of on steroids, a little bit heftier. Um, there are probably are some differences between doves and pigeons, but as, as Michelle said, they are in the same family. They have certain characteristics that they share. Um, and so um, whatever, uh, maybe pigeons could be a little bit larger. I mean, there are some very big pigeons, whereas doves tend to be a little smaller, but but I don't really know the scientificness of pigeons versus doves. Okay, okay. I, I didn't know if it was just coloration. We get a lot of pigeons at our work, and I'm an animal lover, and they're coming by me in where we have heaters to try and gain warmth, warmth and I'm talking to them, and I love them so much. <laughs> <laughs> I know That's they're wonderful. very nice, so I don't pet them, but I do treat them as any other animal, which I love. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for that question. All right. All right. So on January 29th, I went back to West Creek Reservation and saw this downy woodpecker. She is a female, as you can tell by the lack of red on the back of her head. I'm going to put those lines in again so you can see how the rule of thirds applies to this photo. So here you can see the subject falls along the sea line. You also want to position the bird within the frame so it has space through which to look. So as you see here, the bird is looking to the right and could hop to the right and still be within the photo. Having the bird's face directly up against the edge of the photo would feel awkward. So you want to avoid that if possible. Now these are just guidelines and as a photographer, you have to know when to use them and when to break them. There are instances in which I will have the subject in the middle of the photo, but that is usually when the animal is positioned directly facing the camera. And I'll show you an example in a moment. Oh, so here she is again, uh, sticking her tongue in this photo. So her tongue is right here. It might be kind of, um, kind of pale to see. It's like a whitish grayish color. Um, 
So woodpeckers have extremely long tongues, up to a third of the bird's body length, depending on the species. They use their tongue to reach into deep holes for yummy insects and larvae. When not in use, the tongue is stored inside the skull, cradling the back of the brain. And this is why woodpeckers do not concuss during high-speed pecking. All right, so here I have a dark-eyed junco facing into the sun. I love the barring detail on this individual's back. And this black cap chickadee seems to break the rule of thirds a little. So the body of the bird is situated more in the center of the photograph between lines C and D. I did this because its tail is sticking out to the left and I didn't want to crop it off. However, I follow the rule in that the branch the chickadee is perched on follows along line B and the chickadee's face is along line A. All right, the male northern cardinal looks his best in midwinter. He has completed a new molt in the fall, and the gray tips of his newly molted feathers have worn away by midwinter, giving him a radiant look. Also in northeast Ohio, our neutral landscape in the winter can really make this bird pop. And I love the female cardinal's warm glow on a cold winter's day. I found this girl on February 20th at Station Road Bridge, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And I have a few of my friends um, on here today who were with me, Amy and Ronnie. I don't know if you recognize it. All right. Um, although I primarily take photos of birds, I love everything nature and always have my eye open for other animals. Uh, what was neat about this deer is she is actually standing on top of a high ridge from my position. You can see how my camera seems to be angled up from below her and it makes for an interesting perspective in the photograph. And I promise you, I think this is the last time you're going to see these lines and then we'll just get on with the animals. Um, but this photograph is one in which I decided to break the rule of thirds. Uh, since the deer is positioned facing toward me, I made the decision to put her in the center of the photo instead of on a thirds line. However, there is that thick tree along line C that helps the photo, but that is not the subject. Um, the reason why this photo's composition still works is because, like I mentioned before, the subject needs to have space through which to look. In this case, the deer is facing the camera and is therefore looking through a three-dimensional space. And she just has such a regal look to her, doesn't she? I love it when I need only step out my front door to see a good bird. Now, this juvenile red-shouldered hawk was perched atop a utility pole on my street on February 21st. I don't want to be that person, but that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, and then here is a mature red-shouldered hawk at Lake Isaac on March 5th. I was walking the woodland trail behind Lake Isaac when I saw a couple of birders returning from their walk, and I asked them if they had seen anything good. Well, I was so excited when they told me about a red-shouldered hawk nest. The nest was tucked back in the woods, so it was difficult to get a clear shot from the trail, and the hawks were still obscured by vines and branches even as they flew away from the nest to perch elsewhere in the woods. However, I decided to wait and my patience paid off as one of the pair came close and perched out in the open for nearly 10 minutes, possibly longer. I'll never know how long that hawk stayed on its perch as I eventually had to walk away and get on with my day. And, you know, as a bird photographer, that's a good problem to have. All right, the American robin is a migratory thrush, but does not represent a sign of spring for me, as this bird is a year-round resident throughout much of the U.S., including Ohio. However, the sentiment that robins are a sign of spring may be true for residents of Canada, as Eber data shows robin distribution to shift northward during spring migration in March and April. The American robin pictured here was fluffing out his feathers to stay warm on this chilly morning on March 12th in Northeast Ohio. Um, perhaps he was en route to Canada, but I will never know. And this was at the, the Rocky River Nature Center. 
All right, so here is when I started using the Panasonic Lumix GH6. So I live in Rocky River, but grew up in Geauga County, so I bird out that way a lot. Sometimes I'll stop by to visit my mom, who still lives there, and sometimes my uncle, who is also a birder, will meet up with me. And I cannot recommend Froaring Meadows enough as a birding location. And if you've never visited before, do yourself a favor and visit in April. The series of photos I'm about to show you were taken on my visits in late April of 2022. So the killdeer can be seen along the long driveway into the park, and I was happy to photograph one of them among the dandelions. A lot of times it seems killdeer, um, they just, they love gravel and cement, and, and so I, I feel like a lot of times that's the kind of background you get. So I was really happy to have a softer um, background with bright, cheery dandelions for this one. All right, I got my lifer, Savannah Sparrow, in 2022 and have Froaring Meadows to thank for it. This species prefers a grassland habitat just like a savanna, but that's not how this bird got its name. The ornithologist who first collected a specimen in the 19th century named this bird for Savannah, Georgia, where it was found. I was thrilled when it flew down from that tree to the tall grasses for some eye level photos. Unfortunately, this gorgeous species has suffered a 49% population decline in the last 50 years, according to the North American Breeding Bird Survey. It is believed that the species benefited from human activity early in the 20th century when forests were cleared to open up landscape for pasture, as this bird prefers the grassland habitat. However, the benefits we once provided have been lost due to urbanization and shifting agricultural practices, such as moving from dairy farming to cash crops and the introduction of pesticides. Savannah sparrow populations do better where harvest can be delayed to allow young the opportunity to fledge their nests that are hidden on or near the ground in dense vegetation. This individual is fortunate to have established breeding territory within a property managed and protected by the Geauga Park District, though I'm just not sure if there was a nest this past season. There could have been, I just, I never went back to check. All right, and here is the Savannah Sparrow again, cocking its head for a cute pose. Love the coloration, and you wonder with the browns and the whites, but then with that yellow near the eye, if it's more like, like blending in to try and protect itself. Oh, like the camouflage? Yeah, I'm sure. All right, the bluebirds are just amazing at furring meadows. There are nesting boxes set up along the walking trail so you can get pretty close to them. And here is one perched on his box. And this bird really is this blue. I know it looks it looks really bright. Um, when I'm editing my photos, I try to get them um, to what I remember seeing. Um, so I, I really work on getting that white balance um, just, just perfect uh, because I don't want to have exaggerated photos. So that is always my goal. All right, the tree swallows at Foreign were absolutely breathtaking. Here, there are two perched on that beautifully budding branch. And then one remained for a solo portrait. And I just love those little pink buds that it's sitting on. When you first showed that picture, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here is a tree swallow perched on a nesting box. I love the textures in this photo with those ruffled feathers and the lichen growing on the box. By the way, the nesting boxes are right along the trail, so I recommend wearing a hat because some of these swallows do get a little aggressive. I was thankful I had a hat. All right, there was a brilliant blue sky that day that perfectly complemented the swallow's coloring. All right, as you might expect, the meadow habitat was full of male red-winged blackbirds in April. However, this fellow here caught my eye. As you can see, he has a glossy black plumage that one would expect of a male of his species, but the black is fluffed with white, and his epaulette is bright orange instead of the typical red and yellow. 
Uh, when I got home, I turned to the Cornell Labs Birds of the World online resource, uh, which by the way is worth every penny, and found that this individual could be a juvenile experiencing either a formative or first alternate molt. However, I wanted confirmation and a few other curiosities that cropped up while reading the entry. So mainly, did this guy have a chance in formative or first alternate mold of attracting a mate? He was certainly trying his best by displaying song spread along with his flamboyant okery call. And I know I have some, some people on the call new to birding. So song spread is what this bird is doing here. He's kind of, you know, he sits there and he kind of puffs up his shoulders and his wings come out a little bit. And that's him establishing dominance that this is his territory. So that's what song spread means. And um, the, the famous call goes, oh, gari. And that's, um, I think that's how I say it. There's a few different ways to say it. Um, but that's, again, uh, a male establishing or trying to establish dominance in this territory. All right. So um, hold on a second. I have more to say here. All right. So. I saw that the birds of the world entry had a section about the authors, and so I decided to track them down. Worst case scenario, I would never hear back. I really had nothing to lose but a few minutes of my time. Luckily, Dr. Ken Yasukawa, Emeritus Professor of Biology at Beloit College, responded to my email and answered my questions in great detail. Dr. Yasukawa did confirm that this is a male in either formative or first alternate molt and will get blacker throughout the spring as the buffy fringe wears off. Also, he said the orange epaulette with black spots is characteristic for yearling males. Yearling males can hold territories briefly during the breeding season, and they perform all of the territory defense behaviors of older males, but they are unlikely to do so long enough to attract females and probably have only very limited reproductive success, if any. So um, I hope this guy has better luck next year. And here is a mature male red-winged blackbird in definitive plumage at Forey Meadows. He was working hard to establish his territory. All right, this female rose-breasted grosbeak visited my suburban yard in Rocky River on May 4th, which just goes to show that anything can happen during migration, and I'm certainly glad about that. My first yellow warbler of 2022 was also in early May. Every time I see my first of year yellow warbler, I sing to myself the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun. And the yellow warbler is among my favorite birds as it is a cheerful addition to spring migration with its vibrant yellow plumage and song that seems to say, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. And he certainly is. So I got some really good looks at a common yellow throat at Wendy Park on May 10th. Here he is demonstrating warbler neck for me, as if I don't know. So those of you new to birding, um, warblers tend to be high up in the treetops. And so warbler neck is the strain that birders get as they're constantly you know, looking high up into the treetops. Um, so it's just a little joke I threw in there, but it looks like he's doing it. He's doing warbler neck. All right, so he came down really low. I believe I was kneeling to take these photos and I love how he is peeking through the vegetation. The second Saturday bird walk on May 14th was just thrilling. This red-tailed hawk swooped down to perch on the Rocky River Nature Center's chimney cap. And I feel like he kind of looks like an angel in this photo a mighty, magnificent angel. All right, the next day I returned to the Rocky River Nature Center with my children. I have two boys, ages eight and 10. Uh, when with the kids, I have the goal of taking at least one good bird photo. I miss a lot of shots with them and that's okay if I can walk away with just one. My time is otherwise spent on my kids and making sure they are enjoying nature. So this particular morning, my youngest approaches me with a dandelion puffball and says, you know, make a wish and blow. So I made my wish and, and scattered the seeds. And he then asks me what I wished for. And I tell him that I wished I can take at least one good bird photo this morning. 
He then grabs a pawpaw for himself and says, I wish for mommy's wish to come true. He's so sweet. He then, you know, scatters the puffball seeds. Uh, just minutes later, we happen upon the Swainson's thrush, and I got several clear photos of it. So making a wish on a puffball doesn't always work, but the strategy sure worked for me that day. So I went to McGee Marsh after the biggest week in American birding on May 17th. The advantage to going the week after the biggest week is the boardwalk is less crowded. The disadvantage is the leaves were out, whereas the previous week offered more bare branches, which is better for seeing and photographing birds. However, this bald eagle wasn't too obscured, thankfully. Also, another thing I noticed going to McGee the week after the biggest week is there were more female warblers than males. Apparently, the more brightly colored males had all migrated through the week before, or not all of them, but, you know, most of them. Um, the ladies were still a pleasure to see, though, like this American red start. And here she is again. I love the way she's kind of, you know, cocking her head. And this female bay-breasted warbler posed for many photos. And this bird was en route to the boreal forests of Canada, though this species does also summer in the northern New England states as well. So according to the National Audubon Society's Survival by Degrees report, climate change has put this species at risk as a three degree Celsius rise in global temps will push them far up to northern Quebec and Newfoundland where they will lose 100% of their current territory and only gain 35% of new. Now, their vulnerability status is high. You can review Audubon's Survival by Degrees report online at, um, there we go, at uh, audubon.org slash climate slash survival by degrees to find out how your favorite bird species will be impacted by climate change. I personally don't like being presented with information like this without being informed as to how I can help. So at the bottom of the survival by degrees webpage, Audubon lists several ways. They provide a climate action handbook, information on expanding renewable energy, a link for working locally on climate, planting native plants, and of course supporting Audubon in their efforts. As for working locally on climate, our chapter is participating in Climate Watch, and we are taking volunteers to assist us with a bird survey on January 21st, as Marianne um, said in the announcements. So there are only a handful of target species that we will be counting. If interested in learning more, please reach out to Marianne Romito. And also, we do have a link to Climate Watch on our website, and apparently there is um, a presentation tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, uh, reach out to to Marianne. So I plugged that for you. All right, so the next day on May 18th, I visited Howard Marsh and saw this horned lark. This bird was right next to the parking lot. In fact, you can see a little bit of the gravel right there from the parking lot on the lower left side. I was crouching down between cars and at one point laying down in the parking lot to get these shots, hoping I wouldn't get run over. Um, it was totally worth the risk. So one of the cutest of the baby birds has got to be the Canada goose. And what I like about these photos is you have a soft and fuzzy subject within a harsh and prickly vegetation. Uh, he didn't really seem to mind though. However, the real reason I was at Howard Marsh was to see a yellow-headed blackbird. This species primarily populates the prairies of West and Central U.S., but luckily for us, they have a sliver of breeding range along the Lake Erie coast of Northwestern Ohio. And this was another lifer for me in 2022. So here I'm sneaking in another non-bird photo. I just love chipmunks and this one was way too cute to pass up. This was taken on May 20th at Beaver Marsh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Now the second Saturday bird walk in June was another really good one. We had a house wren perch very close to the group on the trail.
I love the look of this gray blue heron framed by leaves. Also, a yellow warbler had made its nest about 20 feet into the marsh from the trail, and the group was able to observe the male feeding the fledgling. So here's the fledgling that had hopped out of the nest. And then here's the male approaching with some food. It seems the fledgling doesn't exactly realize where dad went. Uh, but don't worry, they made the connection. And baby now has the yummy insect. So I had heard about bobolinks with buttercups at South Russell City Park, so went to check it out on June 12th. I will definitely be returning this June in hopes of getting some similar photos. It's a really nice park with a playground for the kids. I brought my kids on this day. We walked around to find the bobble links and then they got rewarded with some playtime while I reviewed my photos and camera. It was an excellent morning. I visited Lucia S. Nash Preserve, owned and managed by the Ohio Nature Conservancy, and was lucky enough to see this gorgeous eastern kingbird on June 25th. I would see more eastern kingbirds at the Lorraine Impoundment on July 4th. And then I saw a kingbird nest, and just look at that sweet chick. And then I saw that there was a fledgling perch just above the nest, and this was all observable from the trail. I never step off the trail, especially with sensitive individuals like nesting and fledgling birds. And remember, I do have a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, and I do crop my photo, so I was not as close to these birds as it may seem. Also on July 4th, um, I saw a juvenile green heron. I had to change over to manual focus for this photo since the bird was obscured by vegetation. I then found a vantage point in which the bird was not obscured, but was in shadow. So I'm not sure which photo I like better. There were also many beautiful barn swallows flying around um, the, the pond at the impoundment. And sometimes there were multiple swallows perched on a single branch or reed. I took my I took my kids birding, <clears throat> excuse me, the morning of July 7th, and my eldest son tells me he wants to see a great blue heron. Well, target species achieved as Rocky River Reservation delivered as usual. This individual is a juvenile, as indicated by the solid dark gray crown. Adults will have a clean white crown. Um, I also love the mottled look of the juveniles. I found a leucistic song sparrow at Bath Nature Preserve on July 8th. Leucism is a term that is used to describe a wide variety of conditions that result in partial loss of pigment in an animal. In this case, you can see the feathers of this bird's face and head appear white due to lack of pigment. You can also see this bird is missing some tail feathers. It's had a rough time, unfortunately. This field sparrow was also at Bath Nature Preserve and had just taken a bath in a puddle on the trail and then hopped into a bush to preen. I love how it fanned out its tail feathers for this photo. Sandy Ridge Reservation is another hot spot I like to occasionally visit for birding. Here is a young indigo bunting. And here is Mama coming to feed it. This was on July 16th. I love a good mystery. And we saw this bird during the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk on July 23rd. Here we have a warbler in Cleveland at the end of July in the middle of a molt. 
This is unusual to say the least. Experts in bird identification are leaning toward Blackpole, but there just isn't enough certainty to make that call. Nancy Howell, who was present as she is one of the leaders of the walk, submitted a very interesting read about the experience to the Cardinal. That's the Ohio Ornithological Society's quarterly publication, and the summer edition just came out today. So if you're a member, check your inbox. I'm delighted that both of these photos made it into the publication, but they appear in black and white. So here you can see the color versions. A bit of neighborhood drama happened in the afternoon of September 1st. And this beautiful red-tailed hawk crashed into a tree across the street from my house and then continued to, in pursuit of a squirrel racing toward my house. I've never scrambled so quickly in my life. I dashed out the back door and rounded the corner to find the hawk resting on the corner of my neighbor's roof, having lost the squirrel. She, and I'm assuming she as this hawk was big, then flew to momentarily rest on the utility pole before leaving the area. Hope she had better luck next time. And this is, um, like I said, a juvenile red-tailed hawk. Um, you can kind of see here the, the rusty red is starting to come in on her tail feathers. Um, that will become you know, a darker red as she matures. And one thing you can't see in this photo that I saw as she was flying is that she has the, the belly band markings that is um, characteristic of the red-tailed hawk. So this beautiful grasshopper was clinging to my porch column in the evening of September 8th. It was huge. I couldn't get close to it with a ruler or anything, but I estimate its size to be two and a half to three inches long. So I included this grasshopper because I want to show you what a slightly different angle can do for a photo. Here I stepped a couple feet to the left. Instead of the light brick of my house for a background, we now have my dark porch window. As you can see, just taking a few steps has completely changed the look of the entire photo. So if you have a subject that is sitting still, try moving around a little to see how it changes your photo. I saw this red-eyed vireo at the second Saturday bird walk on September 10th, a common summer forest bird of eastern United States and much of Canada. The red-eyed vireo gets its name from the bright red iris sported by adults of the species. However, the individual pictured here is a juvenile and therefore has a dark brown iris. In October, I had a northern cardinal in my yard who was experiencing a really gorgeous performative molt as he grows into maturity. I don't typically like feeder photos, but this pose and timing capture the molt when it was at its most spectacular. This was taken on October 2nd. And this photo was taken the next day with the cardinal perched on my red maple tree. My first of season dark-eyed junco back for the winter on October 3rd, also perched on my red maple tree. On the October 2nd Saturday bird walk, this yellow rumped warbler hung out with us for a while, feasting on berries near the trail. Here it is twisting and reaching down to snag a berry. And look at how round this individual is. There is a children's book by Bill Peet called The Pinkish, Purplish, Bluish Egg, in which Myrtle the turtle dove shares the rhyme, but don't overeat, that's a wise old bird rule, a flyer who gains too much weight is a fool. I often think of that rhyme when I see a round bird. Although this yellow rump is far from foolish, I'm sure he's packing on some weight to survive the winter, or perhaps he's just cold and fluffing up his feathers to stay warm. It was 49 degrees that day. And I just love taking photos of birds in the fall when the background colors are golden. We also had a downy interested in those same berries. Here we have a female Eastern bluebird on that same walk with some gold in the background. You can tell she's a female because her blue is more muted.
And I just love sparrows and white crowned are among my favorites. So during the sparrow migration, I visited Sandy Ridge Reservation in hopes of finding some sparrows. This was taken in this was taken on October 10th. And here is another white crowned. I'm realizing I had some good luck with red-shouldered hawks this year. Uh, this is Reba, the red-shouldered hawk who likes to hang out around the North Chagrin Nature Center. These photos were taken on November 5th during a Cleveland Metro Parks bird walk, and you can see the Nature Center's roof right behind the bird. She's actually perched right above the bird feeders. There were high counts of black capped chickadee during the November second Saturday bird walk on November 12th. This one came down to perch on a thorn bush next to the trail. I was delighted to see an American black duck at Clake Park in Westlake on November 25th. I like the composition of this photo with the duck on the right and some vegetation from the shoreline leaning in from the left. And here is the duck again sitting in shallow water. American black ducks are darker than female mallards and sport purple secondary feathers instead of blue edged with white like the mallards have. And you can kind of see her purple um, secondary feathers popping out right here a little bit. I've also heard that um, American black ducks are described as being dark chocolate, whereas the female mallards are milk chocolate. I was also happy to see this gorgeous female wood duck at Clake Park on November 25th. I had actually visited Clake Park as I had heard reports of a male wood duck that likes to hang around the pond, but unfortunately he was a no-show on this day. But she made up for it. On December 10th, the second Saturday Bird Walk group was treated to a close-up of a red-tailed hawk at the Rocky River Nature Center. You've already seen this hawk from my announcements earlier, but I did include a different pose for you here. And as you can see, I, I talked about the belly band. This is the belly band um, that's characteristic of a red-tailed hawk. So white-throated sparrows are always fun to spot. It's nice to have these birds back for the winter. This male eastern bluebird has such a soft look to him. A lot of people think that bluebirds won't stay through the winter in northeast Ohio, and the range maps from both Cornell Lab and Audubon do show that this is only summer territory for them, but I have seen them stay as long as they can find food. Their year-round territory begins in southern Ohio, so I guess they don't have far to fly if it's just not working out for them up here. And we have seven we had seven bluebirds on this count in December, and in January of last year, we counted five bluebirds, so they will hang around. And of course, we can always count on chickadees to make an appearance on our second Saturday bird walks. I went back out to Clake Park on December 20th and finally saw the male wood duck. Here he is hanging out on the shores of the duck pond. And then he gave me a real treat by coming up onto the mulch with the other waterfowl to forage for food. Uh, Tim Chesinski, who is a wildlife rehabilitation specialist at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village, rehabilitated and banded this bird. He told me that AAL was raised with five mallards and now prefers that species over his own. He was released in September 2022.
I would like to conclude this presentation with Western Cuyahoga Audubon's signature bird, the pileated woodpecker, also seen at Clake Park on December 20th. All right, so if you like what you've seen today and would like to see more, I invite you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And WCAS is also on Instagram and Facebook, and I manage those accounts, so please follow us as well. I also just want to mention that throughout this program, I've shown you many photos that were taken during Western Cuyahoga Audubon bird walks. The second Saturday bird walks are very popular and we always have a good time. I try to make as many of those as I can throughout the year. We also have the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walks coming up later this month and I invite you all to join us. So that's it for my program. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and um, if there's any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. If thanks I could so much, out. Michelle. Yeah, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, for those who would like to ask a question, um, please do. I see there's lots of chats. Mm -hmm. I couldn't check the chat as I was. That was as a I lot was of speaking. it. So cool. Beautiful photos. Wonderful photography. Great understanding of photography. Fabulous. Pre I think it was a fabulous presentation too, as well. So you are all so amazing and kind. Thank you so much for your kind words. Sorry, I had to step away for actual nature's call, but that was, that was <laughs> so amazing. Thank so you. Good. Thanks, no, Gabby. I appreciate it. That's very good. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but there's an echo. Oh, I don't know how to be free. Sure. Must be on twice, some, some way, somehow. They send us a chat. I have sent a couple of questions on the chat. Yeah, still an echo. Going back to my teenage years. <laughs> yeah, for, for those, uh, oh, Michelle, I don't know if you want to mention, you do have a few photographs uh, in a show. When is that show at the Geauga Park, Westwood Park? When is that? That is down? actually, that um, is through July or January 7th, uh, I'm going okay. to pick up whatever photos haven't sold um, on the 8th. So it was really great as um, one of my very good friends, Amy, who I believe is on the call, um, her and another girl and I have our uh, like a joint show that we're doing at uh, the Westwoods and at the Geauga Park District and our photos are for sale and 20% of um, the proceeds go towards the park system. And you say that's up and through? Uh, through the seventh. Yeah, okay. through the seventh and I go on the eighth to pick up. I don't know how many I didn't sell. I think I submitted eight and I think I might have three still there. But there's a lot of lovely photographs. Uh, one of the photos that Michelle did have in that show was that those tree swallows on that branch with the little pink buds. And did you snag that one, Nancy? Okay, good. I was, <laughs> I thought so. I was hoping you're the one that got it because you had asked me for that a long time ago. Yep. But other than that, I have never, um, well, that was my first time selling my photos. I really don't have, I'm not really set up to do that. Um, but I have sold one to a friend and then um, my brother wanted one to give to my mom for Christmas. And I, I didn't charge him very much for that, just really <laughs> materials. <laughs> well, again, it was a fabulous program. Um, I do hope that folks who joined us this evening have a, a great evening and uh, again consider becoming a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon at least look at our website and see the things that we are doing um, we have an awful lot going on and sometimes it's hard for me to think about all the stuff so um, pr programs once a month uh, and field trips so no matter what the weather we're doing stuff 
I've definitely enjoyed my first time and uh, I'll probably come back again. We hope so. So everyone have a great, great evening. And thank you so much for coming. Oh, wait one thank second. I, oh. I do see a question in the chat. Oh, a question um, in the chat. Okay. Asking about um, the lens type. So I have a um, Leica DG Vario um, 100 to 400 millimeter lens that um, was made for the Panasonic Lumix camera that I have. Um, and I think there, there are a couple other questions. The ISO settings. Um, so I I don't have the ISO settings like on me right now. I mean, I could go into each file and look. Um, I do use a program called, um, what was it called? Topaz Denoise or, or something like that. And 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 so I, I know like a high ISO makes um, for a grainy photo. And I take my, my photos through that program to clean all that up. So I hope that helps. It's a fabulous program and it's not really that expensive. Um, so if you're a photographer and you struggle with a noisy photo, um, I think you might be able to download a free trial maybe. Um, check it out. I, I am an advocate for it. It just works beautifully. And I think that's, any more questions? I've never heard of a photo being called noisy. Yeah, yeah. It's what they call the, the graininess. Um, sometimes there's like, you know, little dots all through yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So you can, you can remove that. And that, um, that happens when the, the ISO is really high, which could happen for a couple of different reasons. Uh, a lot of times if, if there's the lighting is a poor, poor situations of lighting, it tends to be, the ISO tends to be higher and it gets grainier. Oh, I know. I did want to mention your photos in the Ohio Cardinal that are in black and white of that mystery warbler. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you looked at them, but it pops. It is a black pole warbler. Okay. It, yeah, it, I did I look mean, at it. It just I don't... really pops out that way. I'm like, when I first saw them, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I don't personally have the skills to be able to pick that apart in that bird <laughs> for the identification, but that's really good to know. But it's yeah, a fabulous helps. article that you submitted and yeah, very Susan, good read. Go ahead. Susan Sorry. Becker was asking how many photos of a bird do you usually take? Like, oh my gosh, it depends on photos. how long it'll give me, but usually I will just keep taking pictures till it flies away. Um, that red shouldered hawk that sat there at Lake Isaac, I must have had a thousand to to dig through. And I did pull like I think I think I ended up with 10 or 12 that I chose. And that took a lot. It, it it's great when a bird sits for a long time, but then on the other hand, you have so much to sift through, it can be quite a task. All righty. Again, thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And uh, again, have a great evening and a safe evening. And we will see you hopefully at another program or a field trip if you're able to come. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.